is humanity going through a revolution. The only way you're gonna move forward is surrender. It's almost like this time is eradicating control. You're either protecting a false pattern and you're going down with it, or you're in 5D where you're much more than now. So let's go to frequency, let's go to accents, let's go to alchemy, let's go to 3D all the way to 5D and beyond. Because you've created a portal that's so much bigger and can see through the illusion of the older you. The 3D aspect is more about control. 5D is more about surrender. Surrender is when you get in the now and you're creating worlds that no one's ever seen before. That's why it's so scary. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered why humanity is at where it's at, and if there's a cosmic plan at work, then do we have the Kyle C. Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Kyle C., former number one ranking comedian, New York Times bestselling author, and transformational teacher, coach, and leader. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about what's going on in the world, how it's transforming, and where we get to go. So welcome back to the show, Kyle. Are you ready to shine? It's a shiny day. Woohoo! Woo All right. <laughs> so I've got to go then from it's a shiny day. I can't believe I'm going to ask this question. But Kyle, is humanity going through a revolution? Yes, that's how I see it. I see that <clears throat> a long time ago, humanity thought they were what they do, what they accomplish, their stories, their past, an identity of a specific relationship, a specific career. And I believe that what's happening is the fall apart of what we thought we were, but it's actually what we weren't in order to move us to what we truly are. And one of the reason, one of the reasons that humanity is suffering through it is they believe that what's falling apart is their identity, but it's actually just constructs that we created in order to block ourselves from feeling the actual truth of what we are. So I believe this time is really exciting because Every time something that you're not falls apart, you're still here, but you're lighter and you're freer and it gets replaced by something. If you have a construct that I'm that story of that problem, I'm that story of that, whatever, I'm a procrastinator, I'm a warrior, all these things fall apart, they get replaced by something and it just becomes lighter and lighter and lighter. So it's almost like the purging of a heavier density that at one point we really needed to move forward, but now is actually no longer serving us. So what happens when that actually falls apart and you realize you're still alive, you start to realize those things that fall apart, aren't you? and you're still here. And then when these aspects of you that you're not fall apart, they get replaced by love and now and freedom and guidance, next steps, you know, permission, worthiness, magic. So I see it as even though it looks like a horrific time in a lot of people's eyes, we're moving towards a miraculous world. Um, but we have to go through this thing of the purging of what we're not. And um, it's, it's a good thing because what we were no longer serves us anymore anyway. Thank you. You talked about in one of your recent interviews, you talked about all of these remote viewers saying something particularly mm, challenging might happen in six months. And I think you recorded that about six months ago. Might really challenging happen in North America, more or less around now. Now, we're seeing what's going on with Gaza and Israel. We're seeing what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. We're seeing what's going on in other places around the world. A... Is humanity falling apart? And B, would you say we're still on a timeline for stuff to go down for our highest good? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Well, timelines are a really interesting thing because a lot of people say timelines and some people don't quite know what that means. And I have my own interpretation of it that might not be the end all of what it means, but might be really, yeah. Well, it's so funny because you could have a perspective at one point of what's going to happen three months from now, but then you have a few days pass and new information shows up and all of a sudden that thing won't happen in three months from now because new information arises, right? So an analogy that I've used is imagine that you used to be on one floor of a building and be able to see a goal that's like six months out, a year out, see the plan for the future. And a lot of times that actually happened. But now as humanity is awakening and our old constructs are falling apart, it's almost like we're on an elevator now and the elevator is slowly moving up and you're seeing down a floor and you're like, that's the future. But an hour later, you're looking at a new floor, 
right? You're now looking at the third floor and you're like, oh, that's the future. And then that's the future. You might notice, I know a lot of people have, like for me, the last month has been what 20 years ago would be the equivalent of like five years. Like you almost think to yourself, I can't believe that was only a month ago. Like aspects in my life a month ago were so different than they are now. And people are saying that a lot. And that's because we're doing a lot of inner work that's transcending the cells that have the memory of that time. And so basically these cells are seen and then released and all of a sudden you're going up the elevator. You're no longer the person that has that story. So as we get more and more present, life goes, I'm going to take out these things that aren't the truth and remove these things. And you're going to get lighter and lighter and lighter. And this is what makes in my eyes, the elevator go faster and faster and faster. And I feel like there's an exponential speed that's, that's moving forward in the elevator energy. And really you cannot tell from right now, what's going to happen in a month. You might right now with the information you've seen so far, come up with what'll happen in a month from now, but there's so much new energy. You're not including and new ideas and new stories and new revelations between now and that time. So when those things show up, you actually suddenly see a new floor and you're like, actually a month from now could be totally different than I thought. Right. And this is why it's really freeing to let go of the idea that you know what's coming in the future and allow yourself to be with what's here now. We can't grab onto our future or our past anymore because in one way it doesn't exist. You're always now. And the more that you're in the now and the more that you're present to the now, the more that these things get transcended and you start to surrender the idea that you're not here to control or decide the future or even plan the future. You're here to be with what's here. And one of the things that's here are feelings and, and patterns of unseenness and unloveness. And the way that I really see this time <clears throat> is that if you think about it, up until 2020, we've all had our circumstances just good enough, not all, but many people have had them good enough that they didn't have to go within as much, right? Think of 2019, you could have had a decent enough relationship or a, a connection with all of your family or a good enough job, the ability to travel when you wanted, the ability to just go to a restaurant when you wanted. And then 2020 starts and all of a sudden you, you have to go within. You, you have to stay home for a year and wear a mask in a store and not just get on a plane when you want. And a lot of people lost connections to close family members. And what happens when those things fall apart? You start to get more connected to the truth of what you are. It's almost like a lot of what fell apart were distractions from what was inside, right? So all these things changed and you started getting kind of this revelation of more of what's trying to come up inside. And it's almost like all that's coming up are the things that are not the deepest truth. Meaning like how many ways did you move in order to prevent trauma from happening? Right? Like if you were a kid, I always think of this, if you were a kid and you got like a D in math and then your dad yells at you or hits you or something, that's trauma. So you might create an identity. And this identity goes, I'm going to work my butt off so that I never get yelled at or hit. And then we get under the false idea that that's you, but that's not you. That's a pattern you've actually created all out of, I don't want to feel that trauma again, which means the pattern is actually burying the trauma and the trauma is still here. So you have all these little escape patterns of I'm going to overachieve, or I'm going to look good this way. And then you make the mistake of thinking that's me, but it's not. It's a pattern you created to not feel the root pain that's inside, right? So after 2020, these things that you've been running from are starting to come up, right? And so all the darkness that's not the deepest truth is trying to come to light, not only inside of our body, but in the world. People are starting to go, oh, the government's not who I thought they were. The media is not who I thought they were. We're starting to bring to light a lot of dark things. And once we see them, we can actually shift them, but you can't change something until you see it. So this time in my eyes is exciting because it's like it's going through the attic of our soul and pulling out all the gunk that no longer serves you and moving you to something more amazing. And from there, you don't need the escape of the future and the past or anything else. You start to actually move with the true essence of what you are and what you actually are is miraculous. Thank you. So would you say then 
the wounds that we are share uh, that we are seeing and and it's certainly hermetic as above so below as without so within but the wounds that we are saying playing out on a global stage right now are actually helping us to grab the torch ears, to grab the light, to lean in and look into the wounds, both collectively and individually, as they are actually coming forth, as crazy as it sounds, to help yes. us to heal. Yes. That sounds insane, but yes. <laughs> because in one level, let's think about it, there's a lot of things happening that we do not have control over. And the way that our ego works is it goes, I'm going to, from the small self, from the five-year-old me that doesn't want to get hurt, change the world. Right. But it's out of our own trigger. Like there's a lot of things that happen in the world that we don't understand or trying to show us something that's inside. You know, you can be triggered by someone and think that they really are the one that's bothering you, but they're actually taking you to something from before them. Right. Like you might not know that you might think, well, that person abandoned me. And then you have a deep rooted wound of a, a parent abandoning you when you were a kid or whatever. So I believe triggers are opportunities for you to listen and get here and go within. And I believe heavily that there's things going on all over the world that we cannot control. And it forces you to finally move to a level of surrender. And in our body are all these patterns that are judging and saying everything should be different. And by the way, so many people have different solutions for everything. They've decided that the world should move this way as far as Israel and Hamas, or this way as far as Ukraine, or this way as far as politicians. And I mean, if you think about how funny triggers are, it can't be about the outside because we would all agree on the same thing. Like, why do Democrats and Republicans think the other side is the dark side? Why do they evenly think that, right? Because they think that way's wrong and my way's right. And that's how the ego works. It goes, my way's right. There's no reason someone else is feeling what they're feeling. I have no interest in seeing it. But the more you move to the now, the more you move to the power of really what the now is, which is unconditional love for all perspectives, right? And so <clears throat> when you finally surrender your constant egoic judgment of what's going on, you end up being present for what it's bringing up from before these things, alchemizing them and moving yourself to a higher frequency. You're also saying, God, I can't do anything egoically about this issue. Would you take it? And very often people find that when they finally get into the now and get present, they can find a forgiveness for something. And right after they do, they release something. And it's almost as if that moved the other person that you were forgiving to a frequency of calling you and apologizing or whatever. It's almost like the egoic construct that was stuck in your body was released and it, and it undid your tie to the thing that you're triggered by. And then it can change the thing on the external. And the more we move up to a true surrender that is not denialism or, you know, I'm not saying these things shouldn't be changed. I'm saying our egos can't change it nearly as much as our frequency can. And we're here to find the truest essence of ourself. And that as a byproduct will create so much more actual change and move us to a frequency at one point where wars would be impossible. Thank you. So let's go to frequency. Let's go to essence. Let's go to alchemy. Let's go to 3D all the way to 5D and beyond. What you're talking about is, first off, knowing who you are at, a, at the level of the divine, at the level of the creator, and getting clear as to your energy more than any externality. Yes. My biggest intention on the planet over being the best dad, over being the best partner, over being the best whatever speaker is to know what I truly am. That's my number one goal. I want to know the true essence of what I am. I didn't say what's the best thing I can do, yeah. right? Because that could be a bunch of patterns that do that. And that's but one floor. Right. And so th there's a level that you're stuck on a floor if you become just the doer, right? And a lot of times people, when they meditate or do anything, they think the first question they ask is, what do I do? Which is an old 3D pattern that comes from, you know, an old time where we were told you are what you do, that your job is to get to college, get the job, retire, and that's your identity. And then you had parents that were a bunch of computer programs, basically, too. I, I don't mean literal computer programs, but I almost think of it as we think that, you know, that was our parents, but it was our parents' egos. So I always think of you as this expanding being, and then you're thinking of your parents 
as as your parents, but they're really like the equivalent of like Windows 95, but really from their childhood. So Windows 49, Windows 50, and you're going, I'm I'm just this bunch of patterns that's raised by this old software, basically. And that's not the case. You're an infinite being. You're the space that's upgrading the computers all the time. You're the space that's magical. You're really God's kid. And when you realize that you're God's kid, the now's kid, the infinite's kid, you start to move from a place of infinite expansion. When you think that you're your parents' ego's kid, right? You're moving out of survival because everything is don't get hurt, don't get yelled at, don't get shamed, right? So these old patterns are trying to leave right now. And one way that they go is by the world getting so insane in your family unit, <laughs> in everything that you have to follow what's true to you, even if your family doesn't understand it, even if, you know, friends in your life don't understand it because then you move to a truer frequency, a much deeper, truer aspect of what you are. And that is required right now. It's almost like we got to, if you're moving like a caterpillar, you got to get into the cocoon and find the butterfly you that moves based on a guidance system that's truly telling you the next steps of your life versus be what won't get judged by a bunch of other people's egos, right? I don't know if that makes sense. And I don't even remember if that's the answer to your question. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. I'm going to take us back in time. And then I'd, I'd like to know about more recent situations because- Man, you were such a different person back then, even though you were doing some amazing things. But if I take you back to 2010 as an illustration, uh, I'm going to use the term <laughs> cracked. And that, that may not be apropos, but I'm going to say you cracked and shifted beyond reason. There was nothing on paper that said, hey, let's do this. Maybe you can share with the audience. But you took a leap of faith that I'm guessing you now do more regularly and maybe even, even more... Um, not insanely isn't the right word, but to your ego's point of view, to an even more insane level. But what did you do in 2010? And how did that help um, birth the butterfly from the caterpillar? Yeah. Well, I, and I would say that 2010 till now has been the supporting of the butterfly me, you know, the ongoing support. But there, there was a huge shift in 2010 where basically at one point I, I started kind of bringing this positive vibe into my stand-up comedy world. I used to be a stand-up comedian. And I, at one point had my own inner shift that was kind of at an achievement level. Like a, a, I got into Tony Robbins and went from anxiety to number one comedy central special. I got really excited to share this with other comedians. I was almost oblivious to the fact that comedians might be cynical and not into it. And at one point I created this thing with a legendary comedian who's now passed away, Louis Anderson. And I created something called Stand Up Boot Camp. And we were teaching aspiring comedians. And I was kind of like this Tony Robbins suddenly in the comedy community. And one day I told Louis that I really would love to get over what people think about me because it was hurting because I would hear different comedians kind of talk crap about me and say, Kyle went off the deep end. And what is he a Scientologist now? Is he a cult leader? And finally, one day I said, I want to get over this. And the universe did exactly the equivalent of what you're asking now, like with the chaos everywhere. I said, I want to get over what they think. And at one point, a comedian wrote a blog about me that was misinformed, sp spelling out why I must be scamming people for money. I wasn't even making money at the time. And it was amazing because other kind of edgy comics reposted it and it went viral in a way. And I had just said I, to Louie, I want to get over what people think about me. And the universe goes, well, let's actually make you get over it by making everyone have an opinion on you. And so I had enough information to know I'm about to learn something new. And I always think of the Michael Beckwith line, what's trying to emerge out of me? It's my favorite question to ask with everything. What's trying to emerge here? What, what, what am I actually trying to become? With every problem, I ask that question. There's a, there's a challenge in my life. I'm like, what's trying to emerge? What's the much more magical version of me? What's the, what's the real me even more? And here I was suddenly facing all these comedians had this major judgment of me. And I just said, I want to get over what they think. So 
the old me, the make it happen achiever me was thinking, I'll have another number one Comedy Central special. I'll prove it with effort and then they'll like me. But really a higher me goes, yeah, but then you're still caring what they think. You just got them to like you. We want to get over what they think. You get what I'm saying? See the difference? Like some people go, I'm going to get over what they think by getting them to like me. You don't want to do that. Dr. Wayne Dyer, uh, other people's opinions are none of my business. Right. Yes. And so suddenly I stayed in a hotel for six days and was getting attacked and people emailing me and I stopped touring for a minute and just stayed in a hotel room. And for four days I was picturing I'll have a number one this and I'll prove it with this. And then on day four, a huge shift in my life was I was sitting in a hotel room and saw that my mind was coming up with all these solutions. And I realized my mind is saving its life and I'm not in danger. And I was sitting in a bed for four days, literally in fight or flight because of my thoughts, but that had nothing to do with what my actual situation was. And I had this moment where I separated from my thoughts and I was just sitting on the bed and I saw my mind going crazy and saw that wasn't me. I wasn't my thoughts. I'm just sitting, I'm fine. The me and the now was fine, but my mind is in fight or flight looking at the past and the future coming up with whatever. And it was a crazy moment because I remember all of my past and all of my accomplishments and all of my problems just collapsing and me staring at the wall and feeling a freedom that I've never felt before for like five hours, just like total bliss, a freedom that was higher than any accomplishment, than any number one comedy central thing, than any, anything. It was like the highest, freest thing I'd ever felt. And then for two more days, I just kind of felt this bliss and was not only much more freed of that, but like, it, it didn't even make sense. Now there was no truth in that. I got to fix this. And then I left the motivation world from there because I realized motivation is staying in the egoic construct and trying to get something happening. And then everyone likes you and you're still kind of enslaved to that concept or then you're number one. And all of this is, and then I'm now enough, but you're still, your enoughness is contingent on what you accomplish versus that you exist, what you are. And so I left the motivation world energetically in my body. And I started getting fascinated in 2010 with just the idea of letting go. So I started letting go of eating bad. I, I went raw vegan for a long time. And this is not a pitch for raw veganism. It was much more about the pattern. 2010, I think, no, it might have been 2011. We lived on Maui for three and a half years and burned through one hell of a budget on Maui being <laughs> raw vegan at the time. Yeah. Because yeah. it was expensive. And it turns out it was foo-foo too. Not, not judging anyone for everything, but yeah. uh, it, it was an attachment coming in the back door of letting go. Well, for me, oh, I know what it was. When I was so... When I was a kid, I felt like I got more love and was more seen in a restaurant, right? So, and I, and especially over Mexican food, like I felt like my dad saw me and I was heard much more in a Mexican restaurant. So I actually associated my patterns associated. I'm loved in a Mexican restaurant and I'm actually in danger, not right. And so when I shifted to raw veganism, it wasn't about the food as much as it was about me not living within the realm of my protective patterns and those things falling apart. And so it started being, life started being the sentence that I, I just discovered when I was talking to my friend Diego, he actually said this. We started realizing that as we let go of things, the only reason you're stressing is your mind can measure what you will lose. It cannot see what you'll gain. And this Yes, this is so important. With everything you're letting go of, the only reason you're stressing is your mind can only actually tangibly remember and measure what you will lose, but you can't see what you'll gain. You can't see what you're creating room for. So I started getting fascinated by just letting go of everything in my life that wasn't a 10, 10, 10 on a scale of one to 10 in my soul. So I was like, well, if, there was a lot of justification for keeping these things, but I would be like, should I get off Facebook or at the time, MySpace? Should I get off these things? My mind could justify it. Well, you need it for advertising, right? And I have a rule that if I justify keeping something, I have to let go of it because you never justify your calling. You know, you know, I don't imagine if I justified why I have a daughter, how weird that'd be. If she gets good medical, so I'm going to keep being her dad. If anything felt energetically, like it doesn't align with me anymore without even understanding why I have to let go of it. 
And I was letting go of being on Facebook. There was a long time I was like, I'm not going to go on any dates. And I started noticing that like, it was almost like I was ascending out of these old things. They started feeling heavier and heavier the more I didn't keep addictively keeping them in my life. And at one point, my comedy career felt heavy. I was about to go tour and I was like, God, I don't want to get on another plane. I don't want to. And all of a sudden, my dream career at one point became heavy. It started feeling like it doesn't align. So without even looking into why or what would happen, I just decided one day I'm with Diego and I said, I'm done doing comedy clubs. And we started not doing comedy clubs. And I just started canceling all future gigs with zero idea what would happen on the other side. If I had a mental idea, I'd be still not ascending. I'd be more addicted to that's the thing that I can do now. But by letting go of it with no idea, I felt my body actually connect to a higher frequency, purge the old identity out and move to something higher. And all of a sudden, much higher level ideas showed up, much higher receiving, much bigger synchronicity started happening. And the week after that, I started going, um, what if I combine comedy and transformation? And I heard my ego go, yeah, the way you want to do it, no one's ever done that. And my soul was like, no one's ever done that. So let's do this. So what would happen if I combine these two things? And I started creating a bunch of videos with my friend and then doing college after college as the lecture speaker. Then Agape, Michael Beckwith announced there's a talent show. I went and spoke at Agape. And all of a sudden, all these people in the audience are asking me to be on their shows or at their seminars. Then at one point, Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle's people called me and asked me to speak on their stage. And it was almost as if the world was mirroring my leaps. It's like, you just created space for more magic. You're just trusting the actual feeling. You're not seeing it based on the evidence of what you'll get. And as you allow yourself to do that, you suddenly can receive much more because I'm no longer enslaved to the story of what I used to be. And I'm now really much more God's kid. And then I spent the last 13 years um, harnessing that and continually moving not only to a place of higher vibration, but now much more oneness, meaning all the vibrations exist within me. So instead of me just getting rid of the dark vibration, I also have to be present for it, love it and alchemize it. And you start realizing there's actually no separate self. The more you do this work, there is no actual Kyle. It was a name given, you know, and then you go, what's Kyle? Oh, he's a comedian. He's this accomplishment. They don't even exist right now. Like I can't go to that time other than watching a YouTube video or a remembering it. So you start to realize I'm, I'm all that is because I, I can't be a pattern because the patterns fall away. Right. And I, you can have a belief that you are this thing, or you believe that you're this thing, or you believe this belief, but they can change and you'll still exist. So you can't be your beliefs, right? Because they can change and you'll still exist. You can't be your body because it changes supposedly every what seven years or something you have a completely different body different cells so i can't be my body i must be something more infinite than the cells in my body this is what i'm here to discover more and more and move towards and whenever i feel something uncomfortable in my heart ever something feels off i know that an illusion is about to break off right a limitation is a lie but you might grab onto the limitation and defend it because you think you're your parents kid from a long time ago who might have been very unconscious you're not you're the now and the more you become the now the more you can hear through the lies and alchemize them that's a real thing you start to actually get to the root of where these lies came from and find a new level of forgiveness or atonement and move to a higher and higher frequency and i believe that's what we're starting to do as a collective and there are people who understand that like the people watching this call and me and you and so we're participating with the universe. And then there are people who don't understand that. So they're being dragged into these circumstances. They're having people leave them. They're having their job fall apart. So they have to look at what is actually hurting from these things and understand it's not that you're scared about money or you're scared about losing someone. It's that you have a pattern of fear of being alone or a pattern of fear that if you're broke, you're not loved. These things need to be seen and alchemized. And when they are, you move to a higher frequency that actually takes care of the external issues. It changes them because you'll get the mirror to what you just discovered. So when you start to realize your infinite abundance, you'll start to 
make a space where it's easy for abundance to come to you. But if you think you're just someone who makes $10,000 a year and you're not worthy of it and your dream is to make a million dollars, you're not a vibrational match to receive it. Or same with a relationship. You feel like if this person leaves me, then I'm totally alone. You're creating space where it's almost as if God has to remove those people from you so you can alchemize your totally alone argument that you associate to trauma and heal that and realize there's no such thing as alone. You're just now. And then suddenly you can get the match to that and you'll get a match that could be unfolding with you, right? That That's that's doing the same inner work. Thank you. So I, I guess, well, so, so many different places we can go with this, Kyle. It, it, it sounds like at the end of the day, what we're talking about is a, a, a powerful choice. And, and there's a quote from Rumi that keeps coming through as you're saying this, which is, uh, the wound is where the light shines through. And, and so the wound is not a bad thing. And, um, well, there's another uh, terrible quote, which is, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Until we are willing to go into the darkness and look at the wounds and look at the traumas and realize that they're here to help us and they're here to heal yes. us, you will keep getting gifted with bigger yes. and bigger wounds. And that's what's collectively going on in the planet so yes. that we actually burst through by making yes. a choice to the other yes. side. And not only that, but I will say for me, something that's really weird, whenever a wound shows up or I'm hurting, there's a deeper excitement because I always think of how many cool things I've had. I think of how many cool things have happened in my life. And whenever I feel a wound, I'm like, oh, I've never seen myself with whatever this wound is gone. And I'm about to right? So whenever I feel pain or a limitation or unseen or unloved, I get very present right? And I listen for a long time. There's a lot of meditation. There's a lot of being with. It's very easy when that shows up to, to get distracted, to want to just start flipping through you know, Facebook or social media or just be distracted, go get drunk, whatever. That's, that's the egoic thing that wants to keep you in 3D. But when you feel a wound in your heart and you feel unseen, get excited because you're about to discover something about you you didn't know. And it always has a new lesson and a new angle you never knew. But I do have enough knowing that I've never had a wound that didn't get alchemized at one point. Point. And when I start to get present, I go, oh my God, even better is coming because I'm about to be even lighter. And I think of the people we know of as amazing speakers that are that are people that do the inner work, they get better with age, like Esther and, and Beckwith. And these people get better with age because they're much more than now healing themselves and releasing the lies in their body. So they become better and better with time. And I believe if you're in the real work, you're going to get younger and stronger and better and freer and more powerful because you're closer to the true aspect of what you are, which is like course in miracle stuff. You are a miracle. You're capable of miracles. And I did an event not too long ago called miracles normalized. And I'm really seeing that being the truth. I'm seeing synchronicities everywhere now because there's less and less of the old story that says I'm Kyle, the small self that had a dad that didn't feel safe and felt my mom was cynical about who I am. And I got to prove it egoically. I'm not I'm their kids in one aspect, but I'm the now's kid much more. And that gives me so much more ability and power. And it's not me egoically changing anything. It's the true aspect of me watching as things miraculously mirror the inner work that I'm doing. Thank you. So how have you coaxed, cajoled, convinced <laughs> your ego that this is a good thing. And I know with training, it's trusting you more and more, but your ego, particularly early on in this game, has got to go, this guy's out to lunch. We've got to chain him down and not allow him to do any of this. He's going to blow everything up. Well, one is you just start to know that voice is the ego. You just get better and better at knowing that's the ego. It, it, it's, it's getting so quick that I can catch what the ego is, you know, because you're really either looking from the ego or you're looking from the now right? And the now is just listening and it's just love. And the ego says, what do I do about, or it's not that easy, or he doesn't know my story or he's not whatever. And the ego moves from survival. The ego is only about survival. 
But I find that infinite love is much better at protecting you than survival is, right? You choosing your expansion has much more of a divine protection than survival does. You can see this in obvious examples, like the people that are almost missing out on life, but have 10 locks on the door and are constantly scared and are about not getting hurt or sick all the time and doing every protective mechanism, but also aren't living their life, right? They're very like, they're, you know, it's about, I can't get hurt yet. They're just watching TV all day or whatever. I find that your ability to have something amazing is tied to your acceptance of the opposite. Meaning like if you want to become really successfully financial, right? You got to fall in love with being broke, right? And the, because a lot of people want to be rich, so they're not unworthy to their dad in 1964, right? Or not bullied again in high school. They, these are the patterns that are trying to make the money, right? I want to fall in love with someone so that I'm not alone because when I was five, I was alone and someone hurt me physically, right? These are the, these are the ideas of how the patterns work. So the ego goes, we have to get somewhere else, but always under the ego is a is a belief of unworthiness, unloved, lost, confused, all these things. Uh, I'm a bad person. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be my parent. I don't want to be. And we have all these I have to do, but it's out of a trauma that's under it. So a lot of times I'll have clients that I work with. I do a lot of one-on-ones. I did 2000 or so one-on-ones in the last three years. And um, I noticed something that was really big. Whenever I hear someone say, I got to do this, I got to start this company, I got to write my book, I can hear the energy is not a calling. It's a have to. And I'll say to them, if you don't, what happens? And you'll almost hear, then I'll be a failure. And that means in their childhood, their dad said, never be a failure or whatever. And so that fear from the 60s is running their, I have to do something, right? And what I have people do now often is if they have a deep rooted fear of being a failure, I have them get present and say to the pattern in their body, because it's not them that's scared of being a failure. It's a pattern. You're allowed to be a failure in my body. You're allowed to be unworthy in my body, right? And then the pattern for the first time in its life, hears that even if you are, I love you. Because as, as a child, it never heard that. And so what the old self-help does is it goes, if you feel you're unworthy, we're going to egoically make you worthy. We're going to get a number one business to prove your worthiness, but the fear of unworthy is still running the whole show. So if we say you're allowed to be unworthy in my body, I love you even if you're a failure, I love you if you're not enough, then now we're bringing unconditional God love to the situation and it finds that it can't run the show when it's loved. And so it very often turns into tears and I watch it fall out of my client's eyes and you start to realize I've never loved that aspect of myself. And the number one thing we're on this planet to learn is love, not just love for the people we think are doing the heroic work, not just love for people we agree with, Love for even the shame in your body, love for the guilt in your body, love for the darkness. By love, I mean acceptance. I I mean seeing it until it's heard. This transcends the patterns that actually did the thing that you're feeling guilty about and moves you to a frequency that would never even think of it again. So instead of thinking, I got to stay guilty so I don't keep doing the thing I didn't like a long time ago, you're actually keeping the same frequency that did it and the same shame that causes it. And if you instead move to a frequency of listening to that guilt until it dissolves into tears out of your eyes, you now move to a frequency that would never do that. And you also will watch as the world mirrors that. It's almost like as I transcend the guilt and shame in my body, I watch people around me do it. It's almost becoming normal to do that inner work, right? So isn't it weird to the people watching that as you're finding these inner things in you, you're seeing the world weirdly going through a similar thing, right? Same time. I have this device behind me. I don't know if you can see it. It looks like a little bit like a jungle jungle gym. It's called a pickler. And and my 18-month-old, almost 19-month-old, uh, Hannah Bear, climbs on it a lot. And she started to get out. Oh, She's got a lot of single words. She's starting to put a few words together here and there. And she was on this pickler device a few days ago. She climbed up on top of it and she just started staring at me Mm. and staring at me and staring at me. 
and staring at me. And then she looked at me in my eyes and she said, I see you. This is your one and a half year old? Yes. She'd never used that expression before, nor that three, put the I and you in any that, that thing together ever. I see you. That's what we get to do with our, yes. <laughs> the new gen is, wah, <laughs> as you know. I mean, at 46, that's, that's the words I'm craving to hear. I'm hearing it recently, but many times I've not felt seen my whole life. And it's funny, as adults, we're not even doing that or feeling seen or seeing each other. And your one and a half year old is sitting here doing the most therapeutic healing work on you ever. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But she does, man. She sees the truth. She's not conditioned to believe she's what she does and that she's not enough unless she builds that business. She's looking right in your eyes and at your soul and seeing her soul through yours. That's our natural state. That's why a one and a half year old can do it easier than a grown up. And, right? and when I look at this world and, and, and I, don't, I don't see this, this well, okay, there are all these different measures of control, but it's actually, it's all spirit, it's all God, it's all good, it's all here to serve us, even in the real ugliness of it, it's all here to serve us, but we have been gifted with all these programs inside of us that says, I'm not good enough, I haven't done enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough, right. I've got to, i got to, got to, got to, got to, as you're saying, I call that comment the Iggy, I got to, and, and, yeah. and we're running the Iggy we don't see who we truly are. And what you were saying before, I think it was before we even started, your whole mission is to see you. Yes. Is huge. And the byproduct is there's a different frequency that I speak from. But if I go, my number one goal is to shift humanity, then I might not ascend. I might just be speaking from a lower frequency over and over and over again. And I hear people say that my number one goal is to shift a million people. That's beautiful. But we're at a consciousness now where your frequency is worth so much more than your action. So we'd rather you find what you are and, you know, grab aspects of forgiveness and apologies and release and healing. And even if you were in a cave, at, at a high frequency, you're probably changing more of the world than if you're at a lower frequency and selling a hundred million books. Obviously, if you can do something impactful as an action from a higher frequency, that's the best. But I got to just say what you're what you are is worth more than what you can do. And, and, and being present for that is, is huge and needed. And that's the number one contribution I think in the world. Well, it, it gets back to, I've seen some of the halls that you've spoken at. And, and I think of also some of the music that can be played in these halls and the symphonies that play and that each of us is an instrument or playing our own note and where that symphony ascends to depends on what note we choose to play. Are we going to play the note of the 1960s or 50s or 40s or misery of, of stuck in somebody else's paradigm that they were gifted, that they were gifted, that they were gifted, or are we going to choose to play the ah? Right. And there's a whole comparison aspect too, which is kind of what you're talking about, where people are often trying to be other people. Like I want to be like that celebrity or I want to, you know, I'm comparing myself to that sibling or whatever. And what we don't get, you know, Bob Proctor said once, your value is based on how not replaceable you are. And I believe your not replaceability is literally based on how much more you merge with source. Because the more you merge with source, you start to realize we're each a different instrument. And one of my favorite bands ever is the Beach Boys. And that's because you're hearing five or six, or if it's good vibration, seven or eight different harmonies at the same time. Now, if three of the same guys started singing the same note, it wouldn't sound as miraculous. And if you, if you go to someone else's note, we don't have harmony. And so when people are doing everything they can to be other people, you're just being, you're just shutting yourself off from what source has for you. And when you move to what source has for you, you start to realize there is a unique, completely unique unfolding. And when you start to follow it, you ask less and less advice to other people and start truly accessing something that's guiding you, that has the next steps, that's telling you what to do. And 
it's it's got every answer in it and it's got all the healing in it this space has all the healing you listen to this and it'll come into your body and release the lies that are making you suffer and so we are here to find the unique unfolding that's trying to happen through us and every one of us is different and if we did man would this be amazing <laughs> and you know that's what i believe we're moving towards and it means uh, the news, the doom scrolling, even many of the old school teachers, we have to drop all of that information, all of that teaching. Because, for instance, I used to say I'm the woohoo guy. I'm, I'm just me, whatever me means. But if everybody tried to be the woohoo guy, oh my God, that'd be kind of a freaky world. <laughs> you get to be your own, you with your own song. And that is the divine, whatever we want to define that is, coming forward, birthing through you. Yes. Well, you know, one of my most common clients are people who went to some kind of marketing event. And I'm not trying to dog anything, but it's like they go to a place and those things tell you what to do based on what they did in the past and a different consciousness. So when you go to an event like that and they're like, you have to say this on Instagram once a day and you have to phrase it this way to sell something. You're just learning tricks that other people used. Really, also those same tricks were used to get you in the door. And then, and then you're learning how to sell based on an old way of doing it. There's very little focus on what's trying to unfold in you, which is worth so much more. I mean, imagine if Prince didn't find out what Prince was and instead was like, I want to create songs. I'm going to go to a marketing seminar, but didn't tap into the writing of what Prince could write, right? It would be really weird. And if you go to a seminar that says, here's what to do based on what I did, that would be like, this is the example I use that I, I think is funny, going to a songwriting seminar by Michael Jackson. And he says, Right, Billy Jean. I wrote that song and it was a hit. So you should write Billy Jean too. And then you're sitting here just what he did that isn't involving what you are, that already has come out, that's already happened, that we've all heard, and your unique connection is an unfolding. And so a lot of people go to do this thing and lose their connection to themselves. And so many clients I have are like, well, I was told I have to market it this way. And I'm like, the way I do my business is it's a byproduct of my unfolding. My business isn't even my priority. It's my unfolding. And then the business is a byproduct of that right? It'll tell me, don't have a meeting today or do do this, or I have an idea. Okay. Share that. Right. And it's like, God's telling me what to do. And, and that's the only way I think, as you move into the future to only have a successful relationship or business now is it has to be a 5d thing that's coming in through guidance versus you should do this. And I believe that a lot of old self-help really served a purpose in its time. It was absolutely a conscious shift to move into the two thousands with things like the secret and think positive and all these things. But I believe we're in a time of actually also alchemizing the negative and finding the same level of love for that too and finding the true aspect of what you are by not bearing the negative by only thinking positive the the universe itself is positive so if you're egoically thinking positive to bury the negative it's actually still a negative and if you finally get to the now you'll notice it's expanding in a positive way every anyway so there's fake positive which is denial of the negative and then there's the now which is in its own positive expansion right now Thank you. I, mean, I want to go to alchemizing the negative. A few different places I want to go to that. Uh, however, there's there's a visual, an image that just keeps coming to me as you're speaking right now. And and now there's a, a statement behind it. Uh, run, forest, run. If you remember, and and if you can hear hear my daughter, if we've got great soundproofing, so so it doesn't come through in the actual recording, but no she is going. She is having so much fun behind us. Run, forest, run. If you remember in Forest Gump. Young Forrest, he's got on all this hardware on his legs, and he's told that he's not supposed to run. His true essence, his true self, wants to run, wants to be pure joy, isn't staring at these things going, poor me, woe is me. He just wants to run. And as, yes, he's being chased, and, and this is actually kind of goes along with today's world, he's being chased. Yes. He doesn't believe I can't run. He starts running so fast that parts begin to fall off of him. That which isn't his true essence yes. falls off away. Yes. It's a beautiful analogy. Those, those things that were on his legs are symbolic of the conditioning of being told what we are and versus you actually trying out what you truly are and watching as the conditioning falls away. You know, I was thinking, it's so interesting you said, I was thinking about 
I was working with a client the other day who had a lot of shame in their body and they were trying to get rid of the shame. And I said, well, we just need to do what shame doesn't do. So I had them start saying, I'm doing incredible. I'm doing amazing. And shame keeps them thinking I'm a failure. Why don't I get it? Why don't I ever do this? And instead they started saying, I'm doing incredibly. And I just started watching her cry out everything. She was like, and, and a sentence I've had someone say recently, and I've been saying myself is something that I want to offer everyone watching. I deserve to have an incredible life. I deserve to be free. I deserve to know what I truly am. I deserve to be happy. See, when you have shame all over this, you think you don't. And you start thinking, what would other people think who carry shame in their own body and think that you shouldn't be free because it triggers them if you are. And they realize maybe they weren't living as freely. So you're really, when you're hearing a calling, birthing a new world through you that the rest of the world hasn't seen. This is why following a calling is so needed because you start to actually normalize following your calling and make it okay for you to access the butterfly you and stop being the caterpillar you. And at first you'll get a bunch of crap from people around you until finally you keep owning it and they see you're actually way happier, freer, more expansive, more abundant. And they're like, okay, finally a year later, what did you do? Because I need to do that. So the conditioning that fell off of Forrest Gump's legs is the same as other people telling you what you are. You growing up hearing it's not that easy. Money doesn't grow on trees. You're not, you know, you're not worthy of love. One thing I love to do with egoic constructs, like things like I'm not enough, is make the ego get specific. Like, watch this. If someone says, I'm just worried I'm not enough, I'll ask them this question. At what point are you enough? Like, just so we have clarity with this ego's vague sentence, when, do we, when have we decided you're enough? When you make a million dollars, when your dad says, I'm proud of you, it'll never have an answer. Because the ego likes to stay vague. The ego likes to make you think that you're not enough and never question it. But when you finally go in through meditation or just listening, you start to see that doesn't make any sense. The unworthiness doesn't make sense. It's such a screw you to God to say, I'm not worthy. Like your worthiness is based on some human construct of how much money you make or what you've achieved. You're here, as Bashar would say, your worthiness is that you exist. And, and it's almost dismissing that you were created to say your worthiness is contingent on that you made a hundred grand this year or something ridiculous. So there's no actual answer to the ego's you know, limitations. Like it'll never say you're enough. If a person who believes they're not enough makes $10 million, it'll go, it's only you're enough when you hit a hundred million. And then you get that. And it's like, nope, this is why it's not, it's just insane. And it doesn't, the ego doesn't make any sense, which is why you couldn't be those limitations and you couldn't be the ego. Do you, do you remember Mr. Despicable? Or is it D Despicable Me? Excuse me, Despicable Me. I do. I, I mean, I know it exists. I don't know that. I can't remember if I've seen it. So, so there's, there's this character in it who's uh, trying to be the world's greatest villain. And um, he, as a kid, he comes to his mom and he goes, look, mom, I built a rocket. She's like, eh. And he goes, look, mom, I just sent myself to outer space. Eh. Look, mom, I just stole the moon. Eh. No matter what he did, there was no pleasing his mom, which is illustrative of the ego, until he actually decided that raising these three girls that made absolutely no sense at all to him was the greatest thing in the world. And everything that he was striving and achieving, trying to be and trying to do and trying to achieve paled into comparison to him being dad, which was his yeah. true self. Which we have that in common. <laughs> Amen to that, brother. So yeah. what does it mean to alchemize the negative? To hear it. Because whatever is unseen in your body is just unseen. And once it's seen, it can't work anymore, right? I mean, you can see that with dark stuff, right? Like if someone's deciding they're going to murder someone in a year from now, and then the person hears about it, they're, they're now seen. Their, their plan is foiled, right? Darkness needs to not be seen. And if it's seen, it's done. It's like the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, right? And the ego's only trick is that you don't see it. So when the ego is feeling a trigger and you're trying to fix it on the external, it's because of what they did to me. It's because of that thing that's happening to me. They did it. The ego is doing a great job at keeping you from looking at it and the true source of where your pain is. And so when you get really present for it and you keep listening, I mean, I've been to 10 day darkness retreats where I'm in pitch black darkness, zero light, 10 days, not hearing anything, no phone. 
I mean, after a while, every few hours, something new would get cried out. And after seven or so days, it started becoming miraculous. This will sound nuts, but I could see through the walls. I felt my mom who had passed away come into the room. It was not a vision. It was really my mom. I was having lucid dreams at night. I was finding miraculous things. And bizarrely, that whole week, I wasn't working at all. And when I came back, we had sold more stuff for our company. It was like, all you got to do, Kyle, is go away. Because I thought I'd come out and be like, we're way behind in work. It was like, no, we did way more. It was way amazing. You just work on your frequency and watch as sales go through the roof. And I started really looking at that. But like, yeah, <clears throat> that's that what alchemizing is, is actually seeing it. And sometimes the ego won't let you see it because it'll link it to something else, right? You might think you have a fear of being alone, but this is an ex actual example with a client. I had a client who had a fear of being alone, but what happened was one time when their parents left them, they were alone with a guy that was a creep to them. So they don't have a fear of being alone. They have a fear of being creeped out or abused. Right. And so they associate it to alone. So ego is really tricky. It goes up. Oh, your problem is alone. No, no, no. It's abuse. And the more you see the actual root of the thing, the more it goes, ah, I'm foiled and it falls apart and it, and it gets alchemized. It gets freed. It gets healed. So in our body is a bunch of things that are unseen. This is why I find listening to silence for at least an hour a day, if not two hours a day, will eventually make you see a lot of things in here. And you'll find yourself just kind of slow drip crying throughout the day because you've created a portal that's so much bigger and can see through the illusion of the older you. And a way I see it is like, if you're a third grader, you can't transcend third grade by staying a third grader. But when you meditate, it's like you're becoming a fourth grader. So now it can let go of third grade because you're no longer moving from there. So I love listening to silence and connecting to what's truly real. The now is what's real. And the egoic construct that says I have to, or I'm not enough makes no sense and has no reality to it. So your job is to listen deep and go, where is the, the core wound of this coming from? And watch as once you see it, it becomes seen. So darkness isn't anything other than unseenness. It's not that it's dark. It's that you perceive it as dark because you don't want to look at it. And what you don't want to look at is in your own body. So you're running from yourself and you might change scenarios, but that darkness is still there. And our job is to get in the now and listen to what's in there and, and hear it until we see it. And that's all you have. You don't even have to do like, okay, I love it or pray to it. You just hear it. And all of a sudden you'll have a moment where you'll start releasing something and you change as a human being and you start to have boundaries for things that don't align with you. And you start to move towards things that expand you and you start to become different. And, and that's, that's alchemizing to me and more and more. And people say a lot, you know, I thought I was over this already. That's shame, right? People go, I thought I was over this pattern or I keep doing the work and I can't believe there's more. And I believe as long as you're alive, there's still more. So enjoy the slow release of what you're not Take your time, just keep hearing and move with it. And you'll realize as you keep going, yeah, there's more and more and more to be seen and released. And even when you're 70 and 80, you, you'll still have that. But at least you're not carrying that with you when you die. Thank you. How, how do we, uh, I'm going to put it in the addiction term. How do we release the addiction of living in the constant future so that we're actually living in this present now? Yeah, well... It's so funny you say that. It's interesting how we associate addiction to things like alcohol or drugs, but we don't ever associate it to worrying, to overachieving, to fix a wound. You know, there's no commercials for that. I always think of those old don't do drugs commercials, but there's yes. no parents who achieve have children who overachieve, you know, or this is your brain on worrying. That's exactly like, what I'm thinking. Fried, fried egg. egg. <laughs> yeah. Like there's none, none of that. There's no looking at it from a God level. It's looking at it from an old frequency that needed to exist to come out of whatever, to come out of the Great Depression and World War II. World War II we're moving from a victim mentality to an achiever mentality. But if you look now, it's like we got to go deeper. So yes, one cause of addiction is not exploring deeper. A lot of your need to overachieve almost always in a way, like as a fix, like, you know, I used to wake up and not like what I saw on the scale and immediately be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start my, and it's almost like shame is running the next 90 days. You know what I mean? And then I'll work out every day for 90 days and it doesn't change. 
it's like, why didn't it change? I changed the diet. I changed everything because shame of not enough or feeling like I'm gross or whatever is trying to run this. It's not my highest. And then I've had times where I didn't care. I went deep within. I just felt love for myself. I overate and didn't work out and I lose weight. I've had times where I cried out stuff and lost five pounds in a couple days, right? So I, I'm telling you the frequency has a density that actually has a physical weight to it too. And, and so what causes addiction is a lack of understanding the truth of what you are. And if you understand that some belief of I'm not enough to my dad, I, I'm a failure, whatever, is running your, your solution to that is this thing. But if you instead investigate this thing under it, you'll, you'll alchemize it and then you don't have to do the action to bury it. So you start to get more and more here and you'll find that here can achieve so much more than your egoic, I need to achieve so that I'm not enough. Thank you. We started, we were talking about um, simultaneous realities or parallel realities, different timelines. We were talking about timelines. And so I'm wondering what is this 3D to 5D uh, split or shift that's going on? What do you feel that looks like? And then yes. what is our role in that? It's, it's it, you know, I think there's a simplicity. I put out a video this week on that, the 3D to 5D shift or split. And someone made a comment that actually helped me put to words something that I feel. He said, this is the most not airy-fairy explanation of 3D to 5D. And he said, basically, 3D is staying in the ego and 5D is moving to the God you, hearing yourself from a now and not moving from an old small frequency that's just moving from, I don't want to feel that trauma again. That's 3D, right? All 3D is, is I don't want to feel that trauma again, or I'm even identified with the pattern. I'm, I by identified mean, I think that's me. So if I feel through the trauma and alchemize it, then I think that I'll die, but you won't, the pattern will. So people that are in a 3D reality are much more getting more and more addicted right now and doing everything they can to protect a pattern that's not the truth, to protect a pattern that's the lie that says you are you know, here to not be a failure, to not be unworthy, to prove something to your parents or to not be like your parents and to reject your family unit or whatever. That's a 3D. And, and, and this pattern is like protecting a false self. And to do that, it has to go to more addictions. It has to go to more distractions. It has to watch TV more or get drunk more or whatever. And, it, and it's creating more harm. It's much more about control. The 3D aspect is more about control. 5D is more about surrender, right? Surrender is when you get in the now and and when you're in a place of surrender, it transcends, right? From, from surrender, it transcends your control, right? So 3D wants to control others. It even wants to control yourself. It shames yourself. It goes, what do I do? It's about control. I believe in 2023, 2024 beyond, the only way you're going to move forward is surrender. It, it, it's almost like this time is eradicating control. It's You cannot make a business or a good relationship out of control. You cannot control your partner. You cannot control your job. It's you moving to a frequency of the truest you. So you're either protecting a false pattern and you're going down with it, or you're in 5D where you're much more than now and you're letting almost the universe do surgery on what you're not. So you just get more and more present, you merge with the now and let it remove from you what you're not. The story of not enough, the story of overachiever, the story of fix it, whatever. And you start to really merge with something that has answers for you, that does things through you, that does the talks through you, that does the answers that you don't ever have to go into something going, how do I do this the right way? You just start to be present and let it do the work through. You will say things to a friend from a place of higher love that it wants to talk from than your small you could do. So basically, this is the end of control and the moving to surrender. And through a place of surrender, you're going to expand. And so you even have to let go of control of other people's opinions of you, even if they're all control. Like you can't control other people that are trying to control you. You just keep expanding and let go of it, right? So 
this is the end of control and the the opening of sur surrender, which is actually much more a true state because then you'll move much more into what you are and source can move through you much more magically. And you'll find that now businesses will only succeed if they're moving from that, from a higher truth. You know, it's, it's going to be a weird time because for a while, I believe there will be still 3D businesses that are addictive things that'll do well, like OnlyFans or whatever these things. But that's because right now the 3D is louder, but the 5D is louder too. So that's kind of the split, right? You're either going more to the pattern and protecting it, or you're going more to the truth of what you are and releasing the patterns. Thank you. A few key questions that come out of it, I guess. First is, if we're talking about surrender and surrender at this level, I can hear people, it's almost a devil's advocate, but I can hear people saying, well, then where's free will? What's the point? If I'm just completely surrendering and doing what, what I'm supposed to do, I'm putting that in quotes to, to play facetiously with this, then what's the point? Well, that's the other belief is that there has to be a point. You know, there's a lot of people that think, you know, I think one of the most depressed feelings people have is what's the point of all this? And the underlying given is there should be a point, right? That that's the egoic construct there, that something not here is better than now. And another word for point is purpose, right? I'm, I need to figure out my purpose. And, and that is so arbitrary because you're trying to make something that you do your God, right? Oh, I get it. I get it. I'm a banker now. Oh, I get it. I'm a, no, well, that could change, right? So your purpose is now. It's what's happening now. And if you could undo the idea that there needs to be a point at all, you will feel so much freer and you will move much, you know, that's a burden to think there better be a point. And one of the most suicidal thoughts is I don't get the point of this, but the given is there should be a point. And, and if you undo this small idea of whatever a point is and get that you are a constant expanding thing that the mind would never be able to grab onto, by the way, like what you are, the mind is trying to make sense out of, but the mind can't, the mind literally moves from when you were born to when you were die. It has a linear timeline, what you are and what the universe is, the mind would never be able to understand. So we don't want to try to understand this from the small mind. We want to actually hear what is and undo our egoic definition and label of this. You know, you don't want to shove the infinite vastness of what you are into the small mind that you've had for whatever, 40, 50 years. You want to surrender the small mind and merge with the infinite vastness of you are what you are. That's what we're here to do. So this what's a point thing is another thing that people can use to feel depressed. And one thing I want to offer the world that I've really meditated on a lot is it's never you that's suicidal or depressed. It's a pattern. And a lot of times those patterns are ready to die for your expansion. Like if you had a pattern that at one point achieved a bunch and now you're here moving to a higher frequency, some of those people get really depressed because they think they are the one that achieved. So it feels suicidal but it's it. And if you get that you, you are the infinite unfolding that has no desire to die, right? You got to understand the difference between a pattern wants to go and you. And I can't tell you how many patterns I've told you're allowed to die in my body and I'll watch it dissolve and I'll feel even more freedom and more oneness and more possibility, right? So that's, the, that's another thought is that we think it's me that's depressed. It's not. It's the pattern that no longer serves you and just needs to be seen and allowed and loved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've mentioned before a new field birthing through us right now. What yes. does that mean? Yes. <clears throat> well, it's so funny. I saw Aaron Abke say yesterday something on a video that I thought was so beautiful. He said, everything going on in the world, I think he said someone else told him that, I can't remember, but everything going on now in the world is just a museum of old ideas, right? This is an old, this all is an old world. Everything in this room is something that was an idea in the past, right? And so every, there's a lot of constructs we have and rules that you have to be as a person and how life works and how relationships work, how business works, that life is just about in the old world, life is about what you do. You know, life is about you just better get a partner, even if they don't align with you, you just need to get a relationship going. And there's a lot of very little emphasis on what's unfolding here. There's very little emphasis on what you're feeling, what your calling is, right? That's an old world because what's here 
exists and matters. And to everyone watching, what's in your heart and what's what you feel matters. And I've noticed how easy it is for a lot of us to get in circumstances out of a survival mechanism and let those circumstances bury what's in here. Let those circumstances bury the calling, what you feel, what your opinion is about something, what you need. And I am about this thing is the most important thing. This thing has got the answers. It's got the next steps. It's got the relationship that is amazing. It's got the, you know, next calling. It's got the abundance in it. But we mute that and the old world says, you know, this is how it works. But when you really go deep, it makes no sense that that's how it works. Like for instance, the way we see relationships in the old world is through love songs and romantic comedies. It's it's all these concepts of I always think of the song Will You Still Love Me by Chicago. He says, just say you love me. He goes, just say you love me for the rest of my life because I can't go on. Okay, he just said I'm suicidal if you don't commit forever, <laughs> yes. right? And and then this poor woman's dating this guy. And if a person said to me as a friend, a guy told me if I don't tell him I love him for the rest of his life, he'll kill himself. I'd be like, that's a dangerous situation. But we look at that and go, that's romantic. That's not love that's attachment. Yes. And we mistake love and attachment. That's the old world. Attachment says, I really miss that person. I must love them so much. No, no, that's just attachment, right? Because as Maya Angela would say, who always spoke from the truth, love liberates. And if you can be in a place of helping someone else liberate, and they can be in a place of liberating you saying, I love you no matter what you do, you are the best choice. And you're not with them because you made a deal six years ago. You're with them because they're expanding your soul. So in the new world, the true world, it's love is now love loves you unconditionally, right? You are abundance. It's not that money is abundance. You are abundance. Every dollar that you've ever made came from you. So let's get excited about you and not money and make money more your God than you. You got to know every idea, every creative possibility that came from you that came from the space we got to start worshiping this or god or the essence of what you are and then the external things will mirror that so that the new world to me is just the truth because it it can't be argued with in a way and when it is from an egoic construct it it doesn't make any sense when they try to and you start to realize that you you can embody truth and embody what the new world is and so that's trying to birth through you when you listen to silence when you learn what actual love is when you move in accordance with what the highest says not what other people out of their shame tell you that's the world that is trying to birth through you and you're creating worlds that no one's ever seen before. That's why it's so scary because you get a calling that comes in and goes, what if I did this? But that's against the world you're used to. But if you follow it, it like my career, this at one point was a scary, crazy thing that would have to be the purging and the goodbye to me as a very successful stand-up comedian. And I had to go through ridicule. But at one point, the calling still spoke and I kept going. And then it purged the people that don't align with me. And now it's totally a normal thing in the world for me and people around me that this is what I do for a living. I'm this speaker. But at one point, that wasn't a thing in the world that I was. So that moved into a new world. And I've had thousands and thousands of emails of people who've changed their life from different things we did. So you start to go, okay, that was the universe trying to work through me. Literally, it's like I, everyone watching Imagine that the universe and God through callings, through listening, through meditation is trying to heal the world through you. And if you listen to the shame, you're staying in the old world. If you listen to the guidance, you're creating the new one and you're going to purge your shame and people around you shame too. So before I ask where people can go to find out more and to find your work and, and everything coming up, when those um, feelings, those emotions, those um, crazy thoughts of the egoic mind come up, and say, hey, we got to go into survival mode. We got to go hide under the table. There is no way you're dropping your stand up career and going to do something else. You're completely insane. What do we do? At one point, I think that I had so many glimpses of magic that 
those voices luckily for me weren't that loud there was there was a moment i remember very vividly that was a different example that that actually fits what you're saying but i just had so many times where i felt a miracle that i was like what was that and life was chase that find that make that normal right and that was louder to me than the ego that was stopping it right i'm very lucky that i had that it was like so good that life was like what was that like when i had that moment on day four where my thoughts collapsed and i realized i was just the now and the old story fell apart and i was feeling free i was life began with how can i go back there what, how can i make that life right versus like i had that glimpse and now i'm going to speak about it forever it's like i want to live there right so <clears throat> but i do remember one time where I had leapt out of stand-up comedy and started doing this and, you know, went through a year of a combination of miracles and then also watching as my stand-up comedy audience dwindled down because I wasn't doing it anymore. And I started talking what they thought of as crazy talk, what some of them thought of as crazy talk and starting to talk from my heart in this new way. Is it okay if I call that Jim Carrey-esque? Say, how do you mean? Well, uh, Jim like, got to the point the where he had everything. Yes, yes, yes. And, totally. and he hit the point of... What's the point? Yes. Yes. That's what you end up that, you know, Jim Carrey said beautifully, I wish you could have my life so you could see it's not the answer, you know, and because most people don't get to experience that thing they think is the answer. And often when you get it, you go, oh, this isn't it. This, this, I, you're almost more depressed because you're like, I thought this would be my salvation and my freedom. And then you get it and you're like, that's not it, you know? A gold medal syndrome. How many depressed gold medalists are there from the Olympics? You got what yeah. you achieved. You worked your whole life for it. Now what? Yes. And that, and their depression comes from containing and keeping the belief that you are what you achieve. Like you could also win the gold medal, enjoy it, and then release the idea that you are what you achieve and move more to a now. That's kind of what I did, right? Like you just start going, oh, I see I'm in this pain. So I'm going to undo the idea that it ever will come from me achieving something as much as I'm just me. And you still will have achievements happen, but your connections to you. But to answer your question with one part, when when I let go of stand-up comedy and I went into this, I had all kinds of new success happening. But still, I remember one day seeing a comedian who used to open for me becoming a household name. And I started seeing comics that were opening for me or, or were newer at it becoming really big, seeing them in like Adam Sandler movies and Will Ferrell movies and stuff and going man, having a moment where I was like, did I make a huge mistake and feeling that feeling deeply. And then there was still though, this little guidance that was like 1%, but she's like, no, just stay in it. Just stay in it. I'm, and it was like, I'm healing this belief in you. I'm healing the belief that you are what you achieve. I'm healing that thing. So I'm making you feel through this trauma of these people are now bigger than you in that fame world that you were going for and making you feel like you made a huge mistake so you can find forgiveness in that. So I just kept going, feeling through it and had like a year of just being okay with it and feeling a bliss in myself versus in my circumstances. Let me tell you, that's the shift that the bliss is in you versus what you achieve. Like gold medal syndrome is I am this accomplishment. You are infinite. You are love. You are God. Accomplishment is a byproduct of your understanding of what you are, right? So instead of thinking I got to get the gold medal and then I'm something and then getting it and going, I'm still not something, Find the lie of I'm not something, alchemize that and find the infinite, holy crap, miraculous, magical being you are and watch his accomplishments just show up left and right, but you don't care. I mean, you're appreciative of them, but your gratitude is with you and God, not the accomplishment, right? So that every time something comes up that hurts, I know that it's a lie and I know I'm about to learn something new. I know I'm going to investigate it. That's what happened when I saw the comics getting bigger, but that was the ego fighting for a minute. And then it died, it died, you know, that level of ego on that part of that journey. Woohoo! <laughs> Beautiful. We could go on and keep on and go on and go on and go on. However, <laughs> we do get to wrap this up. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to have you back. We're going to have to have you back. I would lo always love to see you, man. You're, you, you're doing a great job. Well, thank you. And you as well. So where can people go to find out more, to find your work, to find everything that you have to offer? Yes. So the biggest thing that I'm doing right now that I'm so proud of is my membership site that we're yeah. going into our sixth year on 
It's called the Absolutely Everything Pass. It is about a thousand hours of backlog content, our old courses, me doing live on stage events. These events we used to charge like a thousand bucks each for. And also I do live calls on Sunday. I do a guided meditation or a talk and then a meditation. I do a hot seat where I'll bring people on and shift them. There's already like 60 something hot seats in the can. I do a live Wednesday night call. I do a Q&A answer stuff. And it basically helps people to continually stay connected to the truth, move to a higher frequency. And one of the biggest comments I've heard about the absolutely everything pass is how expensive it is not to have it. Because when people, yeah, when people weren't on it, they still might make more, you know, addictive decisions, buy more <laughs> alcohol, go to more parties, get the most expensive car so they can get significant. So people like them, but the more you do this inner work, the more you find that your bliss is in here and you don't need to do a lot of those things. So there's money saved in that, but at the same time, you're in this high meditative state. So you're picking up higher ideas and we have thousands and thousands of success stories from the absolutely everything pass of people making higher decisions through meditations that we offered and stuff and shifting things. So here's the craziest part for the public um the absolutely everything pass is either 79 a month or 795 dollars uh for a year but if they want to put in i think we could do inspire as the code for your inspire nation um if they type in inspire we'll make it 299 dollars for a year and i'm telling you within the first week it'll pay for itself and you will be with a group of people who are like-minded moving to higher and higher frequencies there's a community aspect there's literally six live events a week and then an archive of and we have new live events coming that are like on stage events that are you know coming in january all kinds of cool stuff and so they're all on there. There's, I don't know, like 20 past courses. There's stuff on money, relationships, everything. And people stay on, man. They they really love it with thousands of people on it. And I'm very proud of it. So if they want to join us, they can type inspire into the website, which is absolutely everything.tv, right? I think it is absolutely everything.tv. And they can type in inspire for you, for your uh, show. And then it literally will go from $795 to $299 for a whole year. And I promise you, it will shift your life. You have to join us, be with us on the Absolutely Everything Pass. And then also, I have two books out. The Illusion of Money is my favorite of the two. And there's also I Hope I Screwed This Up, which is great. And then there's YouTube. They can watch 500 videos on YouTube also. Love it, love it, love it. And you have been a, a, a busy non-doer. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like doing still happens, but there's no me going, what do I do? Right. I didn't have, I didn't have one part of me that said, what's the best thing to say on this podcast yet everything was done. And this is what I'm offering the public that they all have access to. You can undo so much stress and over time that you're putting into something that will actually lower the quality because you're egoically going to create it versus you learn how to be guided and do this from your guidance and let it create what it wants to create through you. So, and also, you know what I love to mention too, is we have a live in-person event in Glendale, California coming June 20th through the 23rd, a four-day event called The Big One at the Glendale event, uh, Glendale, California Theater, the Alex Theater. And if they want, they can get tickets for very cheap at that too and come to a four-day event. Um, yeah, that's kylecease.com slash big one and join it. Aaron Abke is going to come speak at it and also my friend Kim DeRamo too. But you're going to see one of the craziest events you've ever seen at this. And you're, you will not be able to unknow what you know from this event. So join us at the big one, too. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And we have Aaron coming on the show just a couple days after you. I love the synchronicity. Oh, I love him. He's and so genuine and awesome. I'm, I love that you have him. I, I think he's a great guy. Any last words that you want to share? And I couldn't agree more. Any, any last words that you want to share, Kyle? You are an infinite being. You are enough. And it's up to you to prove me right on that. Ooh, it's up to you to prove me right. Oh, that's In a other challenge. Words, Accept it. I always think to myself, it's like, well, you can prove me wrong or you can prove me right. You can show me your limitations forever and show me how hard life is, or you can join me in how I see you, which is an infinite being. And, and receive that and then move in accordance with that and watch what happens. You'll prove it to yourself. Woo 
Oh, got to wrap this up for now. This has been brilliant. I'm going to send everybody your way. We're going to remember, inspire. We're going to go to every, absolutely everything.tv. Kyle, this has been more than I expected. And, and, and I feel like I'm talking as a host here, which I guess I am. So let, let, me, let me just drop that shield, my friend. Um, it's beyond words. What you've done, how far you've come, and I don't mean done as in doing. How much you're practicing what you preach, how much you've shifted and changed, how much you are living in that ever-present beautiful now, and how much you are living by that and not what, and not the artificialness that the ego will bring up or that the world will bring up is stupendous. Well, it takes one to know one, brother. I, I receive you so much and I feel so seen and I appreciate you saying that. And I see the same in you, man. You're, you're a beautiful person. You have a great show. And I'm, I'm always here to, to join you anytime you want. Oh, I will have you back. I will definitely have you back. Oh my goodness, there's this baby. Where's Hana? Where's Hana? There's Hana. Where's Hana? Where's Hana? There she is. Oh my goodness. Oh. Hi, Hana. So beautiful. So, and this is why we do this. I know. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Thank Congratulations, you. man. It's a huge deal. It's going to you. deepen your work. It's going to deepen your heart. It's amazing. And and just just as you were saying, um, she um, the, the Buddhist term is to cut through cuts through the obscurations. She cuts through the uh, the uh, BS that the egoist mind wants to give us. So, right. Because she knows what's important, what's not, and and will point out very quickly when you're out of alignment. Right. I I get it. Mine did that too. Still does it constantly. Yep. And we'll yeah. do it more. And I'm convinced yeah. and more and more and more. Yeah. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Well, she's beautiful, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, I know. <laughs> you heard Hi, that, Anna. didn't you? Hi, Anna. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, dive into the inner work, get out that spotlight, go for it, whatever you see, whatever you find, and discover the holy crap miraculous being that you are, and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! If you want to check out our School of Mystics, where we come together four times a week to bring your energy up, 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 way up, transforming lives, shifting your subconscious, rewiring you, and getting you to that perfect place of now, simply click on that link below. And if you want to learn how to channel, how to hear from the other side, from angels, from guides, from loved ones, from anyone on the other side of the veil, or simply get guidance and direction, simply click that link below for automaticwriting.com as well. And... If you simply want a daily attunement to bring your energy up, up, up on a daily basis, go to dailywoohoo.com. Again, dailywoohoo.com, where I help you through the automatic writing process. I'm doing the automatic writing, sharing the attunement with you. I give you an attunement each and every day to help bring your energy up. On that note, here's a link to the next amazing show. Love you guys so, so much. Keep on shining bright. How does it get any better than this? <laughs>